frequency ADT1 are usually the main things that are considered part of the brachial plexus. So first you have roots, then you have trunks, and then you have divisions and cords. And it's not, we're not going to get into so much of that, but then understand at the other end, then you have peripheral nerves, which are named nerves. Because when we talk about dermatomes and monotomes, we're talking about spinal nerve root levels. Okay? So we'll talk about what's the distribution for C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. But then also we'll talk about distribution of peripheral nerves. Like when we talk about what happens when you have median nerve problems, where is the distribution of that? <coughs> That's going to be a little bit different. Like on the hand, the we'll median nerve is usually the this part of the anterior port surface of the first three fingers and around the back a little bit, then you're gonna have ulnar nerve, which is here, and then you're gonna have radial nerve back here. We'll go over all those again. But just understand the difference between nerve root distribution and peripheral nerve distribution. And then anything like I say is that they start out with nerve roots here, they mix and match and blend together, and then on the other end they come out with these different radial nerve, median nerve, and ulnar nerve. And they're going to be made up of more than one nerve root. It's like I was saying before, the body has some redundancy built in so that if you have, you know, if it was just straight from here, to, right straight to a muscle, and you lose that nerve root, you're going to lose that muscle. But these peripheral nerves are made up of a combination of different nerve root levels. Okay, so this is what we talked about. You have nerve roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches. So like I said, what's more clinically significant is the nerve roots here. So that's like if you talk about disc herniations and you talk about nerve root levels, then that's going to be dermatomes, monotomes, things like that. And then when you talk about on the other end here, where you have specific named peripheral nerves. So most of what we're going to talk about is this part and this part. It's not so much critical in, in the in-between. But just understanding it's like mixing and matching. It's like going on a bunch of freeway on-ramps and off-ramps. So then these terminal branches is going to be musculocutaneous. So from the name of that, you can tell that some of it's going to go to muscles, so it's going to be motor, and then also it's going to be sensory. So it's going to be more up into this area here. And then you're going to have the axillary nerve, which is C5-6. And then the radial nerve, which pretty much covers all, almost all the brachial plexus. And then median nerve, same thing. And the ulnar nerve is a little bit lower, so it's going to be CAQ1. So again, here's a picture. And like I said, mostly what we're being concerned with is nerve roots on the proximal end, and then what comes out on the distal end is the named nerves or peripheral nerves. So there's a lot more things that can have cause problems to the brachial plexus. Because now we're talking about things that are going down the arm. Right? So like tugging or pulling on the arm. Like I have a patient that was uh, years ago in a VW Beetle. Not the new ones that they had now, the old, old school ones. And this is back when we didn't necessarily, they might not have even put seat belts in. So he was in the back seat, the car rolled over, and he's tumbling around. And basically, the, the head and the shoulder get separated, and so he had an avulsion of a lot of the nerves in the brachial plexus. Right? So basically, he's got one arm that's more or less paralyzed, so it's got atrophy. But he survived, so. So all of these different things. Some of the same things that can do the cervical plexus, uh, gunshots, stabbings. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about things where, where you're pulling on the arm. Because just think of it, there's nerves that are going down the arm, so you pull on it, you can injure those. Automobile accidents, fractures, tumors, all kinds of different things. Then we talk about scaling anticus and then cervical rib. So that's where you start talking about thoracic outlet types of conditions. So 
So then when we go, when we're doing things to test the brachial plexus or, or lumbar sacral plexus, you're talking about dermatomes, myotomes, and DTRs, deep tendon reflexes. Okay. So we'll be going through those. Basically what you're doing is you have sensory organs that are in, in the tendons and the, they sense a slight stretch. When you're tapping on a tendon, what you're doing is you're giving it a, a little bit of a stretch and so that starts a reflex that goes to the spinal cord and then comes back and causes a contraction of the muscle. So you have all your tendon organs, muscle spindle cells, things like that. And there's basically, you're looking for a motor response, which is a muscle contraction. So you tap on the tendon, the muscle contracts. Simple as that. But then you're going to, if, if you get a, a, if you have a single response and you get something like that, like clonus, you know, then you're talking about other lesions. So it's normal to just have one response. The muscle contracts once, not multiple contractions. And then the way that you grade the reflexes on a scale of one to five. Okay, so two is basically considered normal. But some people, you're just not going to get very much of a reflex on it. So that's, what's more significant is a variation from one side to the other, or one particular reflex is different than, than all the other ones. Okay? So you're comparing one side to the other. And then anything above two is going to be hyperreflexive. <coughs> okay? So that's what we talked before about if you have upper motor neuron lesions, you're, you're losing the inhibitory effect onto the, the motor fiber, so you're going to have an increased reflex. Is that 23? Moving through, the per, moving through the range of motion. And then when you start getting to four and five, then you're talking about more you know, hyperactive. Okay. Those you're going to see, like I said, in the upper motor neuron lesion type of thing. So hyperactive, like the increased reflexes, maybe it's moving pretty far through the range of motion. And again, you may have some people that have an increased reflex, but if it's uniform, then that's not so much of a big deal. It's, it's significant when, it's, when you're changing, comparing one side to the other. Okay, so if there's an absent or decreased reflex, it's usually going to be a lower motor neuron type of problem. And then if it's increased, it's going to be upper motor neuron. And then it's normal to see a decreased response as people get older. But that's the key thing is you're looking for symmetry. And so some people are going to have a decreased reflexes overall, but as long as it's uniform, then that's not so big, not such a big deal. And then it depends on you know if the patient's more anxious or if they've been just been doing exercising, that can affect the reflex. Now there's things called a gendrastic maneuver, where basically what that is, is if you're having trouble eliciting a reflex on somebody, you're going to do something basically to distract them, okay? So typically, if you're talking about a lower body reflex, you're going to have them pull their arms apart like this. And then if you're talking about an upper body reflex, you'll have them like squeeze their legs together, or you can you know, put a pillow between the legs, you have them squeeze. So it's basically kind of distracting their nervous system so they're not focusing on the reflex as much. So other things, you know, you have them look, have them close their eyes, and then you can do the thing where they contract one of their other muscles. Or also they can have them clench their teeth. So the thing when we're doing ref deep tendon reflexes, you're testing a specific reflex that usually matches with a specific nerve root. So when we talk about C5, we'll be talking about the biceps. C6, brachioradialis, C7, triceps. Not every level is going to have a reflex. In the lower extremity, you pretty much only have two that are commonly done. There are other reflexes for other levels in the, low, in the lower extremity, but you're pretty much only doing one, two. The patellar reflex and the Achilles reflex. Okay. 